So uh, the content of this video is all about population structure. So um, this corresponds to chapter 11 in your textbooks. So the elements of population structure that we're going to cover are patterns of mortality, age distribution and sex ratio within populations. So one of the main ways that we study patterns of mortality um, in populations is to construct life tables. Um, so life tables summarize the pattern of survival uh, in a population and there are three main types of life table that we can construct. So the first type and probably the most um, effective is a cohort life table. So this is where we identify a large group of individuals born at the same time and follow their fate throughout their lives. So if you can imagine, maybe we could take a thousand butterfly eggs and follow them through all their different caterpillar instars and through pupation to adulthood and look at mortality at all of those different stages. So this is good because we can directly look at causes of mortality and proportions of mortality in all of these different stages. But for many organisms that we might be studying, to construct a cohort life table isn't going to be practical. Maybe the organism we're studying is, is very long lived. Um, we certainly couldn't construct a cohort life table with giant sequoia trees, for example. So sometimes we have to construct static life tables. Um, so there are two examples of these. Um, the first is over a short period of time, we record the age at death of a large number of individuals. Um, and I'll cover an example of a, a static life table like that in a second. And there's a third type of life table which also produces a static uh, life table, but it's called age distribution table. Um, and how we construct this is at a given time we record the proportion of individuals in the population that are in different age classes. Um, one of the problems with life tables like this is that they assume that those uh, age, class, age classes are not shifting through time so they also assume that there's no kind of growth or reduction in population over time. So this is a famous example of a static life table. So in the 1940s a scientist called, called Adolf Murie studied doll sheep in Denali National Park in Alaska and um, he collected uh, 608, I think, skulls of these Denali sheep. And by using the, the rings on their horns, he could age these different skulls. And so he could determine the proportion of individuals that had died in different age classes among those skulls that he collected. So this figure on the left is the life table that was constructed by Adolf Murie um, using his uh, doll sheep data. So in the first column you have age classes um, of one year in the case of doll sheep, but depending on the organism you're studying, those age classes might be different. So you could construct a life table for bacteria where those, those age classes might be in minutes or even seconds. Um, the second column shows the number of survivors at the beginning of each age class. And you can see that even though um, Adolf Murie only collected 608 sheep skulls, um, he's converted um, all of those values to the number of deaths per 1,000 births. And that's for ease of comparison of this study with comparisons with other populations or other organisms. Um, in the final column, um, he has the number of deaths in each age class. So essentially we can use this data now to construct what's called a survivorship curve. So survivorship curve just looks at differences in mortality rates of uh, individuals of different ages in the population. And what you can see from uh, the survivorship curve in doll sheep is that there's um, a fair amount of mortality of very young individuals but then beyond that or past the first um, kind of six months there's very little mortality in those young sheep and then suddenly uh, the sheep reach a certain age about kind of eight to ten years old at which mortality suddenly increases um, and by observing these doll sheep um, in their natural environment and understanding their natural history 
um, Adolf Murray sort of understood what was driving that survivorship curve. So essentially, most of the mortality um, of these doll sheep comes uh, as a result of predation by wolves. And most doll sheep are very good um, at avoiding that predation, uh, but that's not the case for very young sheep um, and for older sheep that become less mobile. So survivorship curves can look very different for, for any organism that we're studying, but we tend to sort of compare them to three standardized survivorship curves. So the first of those is a type one survivorship curve. Um, this is similar to the one we saw in doll sheep, and it's where we see low mortality in young individuals and then gradually increasing mortality as, uh, as individuals age. And those kinds of curves um, are seen in doll sheep, as I mentioned, humans have this kind of curve, and many annual plants have this kind of curve as well. So it goes to show that these can be organisms that have very wide ranging lifespans, um, but they can still show very similar shaped survivorship curves. The second type of survivorship curve, type two, is where we see a kind of even rate of mortality across ages. So the rate of mortality in the population um, doesn't really change um, as individuals age. And that's something we see commonly in many bird species and also in many reptile species. The third type of survivorship curve is a type three curve. This is where we have extremely high mortality in young individuals and then lower and lower mortality as individuals age. So a good example of this would be um, marine fish. So mackerel, for example, will produce um, upwards of a million eggs uh, per female, but all but about 10 of those eggs will die within the first 70 days of life. So you'll notice on the, the y-axis um, of these survivorship curves, um, we see a logarithmic scale. Um, and that's just because if we used an arithmetic scale there, you would see a change or a curve in that uh, survivorship line even if mortality wasn't uh, mortality rates weren't changing uh, with age so by using the logarithmic uh, curve we can see a straight line in that uh, curve type 2 where mortality rates aren't changing with age so the second element of population structure that i'm going to talk about uh, is age distribution so by studying um, age distribution, we can get a sense of um, periods of high or low reproduction um, in the recent history of a species or population. Um, we can get an indication for periods of low juvenile or adult survival. Um, and we can get an idea of whether a population is growing or declining. So to give an indication of um, why uh, studying age distributions within a population can be can be uh, enlightening. I'm going to show this comparison of two uh, studies of populations of trees. So essentially what the researchers did here is, is uh, by understanding how tree diameter uh, relates to tree age, they could measure lots of trees in a population and estimate their age and then look at the age distribution within those populations. So the graph on the left um, is a study of white oaks um, in forests in Illinois. And the graph on the right is a study of cottonwoods um, in Rio Grande in New Mexico. So in the case of the white oaks in Illinois, you can see the majority of the individuals are very young. So the age distribution um, is biased towards young individuals. What that means is that the older individuals within the population are managing to reproduce and replace themselves. So the population is, is probably rising or at least staying constant. Conversely, when we look at the cottonwoods in the Rio Grande, um, we, our age distribution is, is biased towards much older individuals. So it seems that the old individuals in this population are not able to reproduce um, well enough um, or consistent, consistently enough to replace themselves. And in fact, in this case, what's happened is in this region of uh, Rio Grande, the, um, the construction of dams has prevented the kind of regular flooding of these areas. And it's that flooding that allows 
uh, seeds of these cottonwoods to germinate and become established. So after the production of these dams, uh, we actually haven't seen any successful reproduction of these cottonwoods um, for around a decade. So by looking at this age distribution, we can see that the population um, of cottonwoods is struggling, declining, and that this species in this area is uh, under intense threat of extinction. So the final element of population structure that I'm going to talk about um, is sex ratio. So this is defined um, simply as the relative frequency of each sex in the population. So most um, organisms and populations have a roughly equal sex ratio, so a ratio of one to one males and females. So why is this? Well, the most common answer to that um, and the, the broadest answer is frequency dependent selection. So this is the idea that the fitness of a phenotype depends on its frequency relative to other phenotypes. So in this case, selection is going to favour the rarer sex. So if you imagine a population like this one where there are a huge group of males and only one female, um, almost regardless of the breeding system of this organism, um, the female in this case is going to be able to reproduce, whereas many of those males are going to face intense competition for reproduction. So that means that when the female uh, produces young, those females that she produces are going to have a much greater chance of reproduction uh, than the males that she produces that are still going to be in a highly competitive reproductive environment. So the fitness benefits for producing female offspring in this case are much greater than the benefits of producing male offspring. But there are um, many examples of populations where the sex ratio is not uh, one to one. Um, and that can be a, a result of uh, a variety of different factors. So it can be the case um, in some uh, populations and species that have complicated mating systems. Um, it can be the case when there are differences um, in survivorship between males and females. It can be the result of exog exogenous hormones. Um, it can be the result of temperature dependent sex determination. Um, and maybe pollutants can have an effect on this as well. So I'll go through some examples of each of these. So first of all, complicated mating systems. Um, so, for example, uh, lions have mating systems whereby there are uh, large groups of females uh, called prides that are uh, dominated or presided over by uh, single males. Um, and so these prides of females are egalitarian, so all of the females uh, get to mate. But of course, only that one male is able to mate with all of those females. So what this means is that... Um, Producing male offspring can be costlier because only the fittest males are going to going to reproduce successfully, and so uh, many male many male lion cubs are fed more; they become larger, and so there's a cost associated with producing male offspring. In addition to this, the competition uh, among males for breeding rights can be very aggressive, and that can also lead to um, increased mortality among males compared to females. So that leads us pretty neatly onto the, the second factor, which is sex-dependent survivorship uh, differences. So this is just where uh, males, for example, in a population might suffer higher mortality uh, than females. So one animal um, in which this has been found to be the case is ground squirrels. Um, so these uh, mammals can live in fairly dense populations. And it tends to be the males that disperse from their natal sites um, to, to produce colonies in different areas. And this kind of risk-taking behaviour from males leads to higher mortality in males than females. And that can skew the sex ratio in populations. So the third factor is exogenous hormones. So for example, this might be where waste products that uh, humans produce uh, get washed into waterways. Um, and some of these chemicals act um, as endocrine disruptors or hormone agonists that affect um, the sex determination of organisms. 
So for example, this picture um, is uh, one of the rivers in Berlin, and studies have shown that 70% of fish in Berlin water waterways are female. And this is likely a result of estrogens um, and other hormone agonists that are being washed into the waterways as a result of the production of human waste. So another factor that will affect uh, sex ratios is um, temperature dependent sex determination. So many reptiles um, like this turtle produce eggs that will, will become male or female based on the temperature of incubation. Um, so in many cases, this is even under, under the control of uh, the mother. So depending on how deep those eggs get buried in the sand, they will become either male or female. So the final factor is just pollutants. So um, although there are certain um, specific hormones that we know are being produced um, and leached into waterways like um, estrogens, um, there are also many pollutants that uh, increasingly evident, evidence suggests might affect sex ratio in a number of aquatic organisms.